Well, thank you, Trinita, for that uh, very generous introduction. And thanks to you and your colleagues at the FRIST for the opportunity to come to Nashville and to present at the symposium today. When I first heard about this exhibition um, over uh, lunch in London with Trinita and Holly, now perhaps eight years ago, nine years ago, it's been a while, um, but at that point I couldn't have really envisaged at all such a beautiful and thoughtful exhibition as I've seen upstairs. It's been well worth the, the wait and it's been a privilege to have played a small part in it. Now, I know that uh, my colleague, Janet Robson, would second those sentiments absolutely, and I know too how much she wanted to be here today. Now, to begin, let's see. One of the many rich threads running through the exhibition is the sequence of small and medium scale narrative panels that depict scenes from the lives of Franciscan and Dominican saints. Invariably reduced to standalone episodes, these narratives can appear disjointed and isolated, but they also connect us with some of the most important and largest paintings commissioned by the Franciscan and Dominican orders during the Italian Renaissance. The history of the dismembering and dispersal of medieval and Renaissance altarpieces in the 19th century is now well known, and for us today it presents a paradox. The loss of original frames and contexts challenges our ability to interpret and appreciate the fragments that we have. <coughs> On the other hand, the dispersal of individual scenes onto the art market undoubtedly fired the appetite for collecting early Renaissance art and bought Italian gold ground paintings into public and private collections across Europe and North America. And indeed, as Carl Brandon Strelke has observed, this process also stimulated the serious study of early Italian panel painting. In this talk, I want to focus on the pictures in the exhibition that are scattered across my opening slide to consider their original contexts and whether, despite their fragmentation, they can together shed light on the artistic patronage of the two major mendicant orders. All date from between circa 1400 and 1470, and all have been identified, <coughs> I'll just give you here the, uh, the, the balance of the two orders, and all have been identified as um, having been commissioned for male houses in central Italy, and the likely provenances are highlighted in red on this map, just to give you a quick orientation of the areas of central and northern Italy we'll be talking about. The relationship between narrative scenes and altarpieces is complex, and despite intensive research over recent decades, <coughs> remains imperfectly understood. Narrative scenes are prominent in the earliest mendicant paintings that survive, for example, the 1235 Pescia Dossal that I show here, and of course the panel of St. Francis with uh, four post-mortem miracles from the Vatican that represents one of the most remarkable loans to the Sanctity Pictured Exhibition. In this respect and others, early Franciscan art drew heavily on Byzantine precedents, which this Vita icon from Sinai exemplifies. Now, whether such panels as this one indeed functioned as old pieces in the Western Latin sense is still uncertain. It's one of the, the many areas where we need further research. The first predella, in the sense of a distinct narrative register at the base of a panel painting, is often identified as Giotto's stigmatization of St. Francis, now in the Louvre, painted at the close of the 13th century. But recent research by myself and others has cast doubt on the conventional interpretation of the Louvre painting as an altarpiece, suggesting instead that it may have been mounted high up on a beam or a choir screen, much like this image here, depicted in one of the frescoes at Assisi. And later paintings of this scale and format seem to have discarded narrative scenes, perhaps due to problems of le legibility. If we concentrate on panels that we can be certain did indeed serve as altarpieces, predellas are absent from 13th century examples, 
and the earliest documentary references seem to occur in contracts signed by Cimabue in Pisa in 1301 and by Duccio in Siena the following year. And Duccio's My Star of 1308 to 11, painted for the high altar of Siena Cathedral, and so not an import, uh, a mendicant commission, should be stressed, is the earliest narrative predella that we can confidently reconstruct. And this seems to have encouraged patrons and artists, especially from Siena, to incorporate predella boxes as a standard feature of major altarpieces. We might note, however, while these slides are before us, um, the prominent role of narrative scenes in the main register of the My Star on the back side of this double-sided altarpiece, and this aspect too would have an enduring influence on later altarpiece design. The Pridella scenes in the My Star are notable for their exceptional quality and degree of invention. And the older historiography has often associated these panels with a younger generation of Sienese painters, Simone Martini, Pietro Lorenzetti, and others, who, so the argument grow, goes, thrived like sorcerer's apprentices under the older, more conservative figure of Duccio. The more recent literature on the Maestar has shied away from such attributional games, but the sense remains that small-scale narrative scenes offered more scope for artists' creativity and invention than larger-scale standing saints. Now, the initial impact of the Maestar was mixed. As Joanna Cannon has shown, at first the Dominicans took a more cautious approach, eschewing narrative scenes in the large high altarpiece they commissioned for their Pisan church from Simone Martini, an artist who would certainly have been capable of providing exceptional narrative scenes if he'd been asked to do so. While the Franciscans seem to have been more enthusiastic, Ugolino De Nerio's high altarpiece for Santa Croce in Florence incorporated an extensive passion cycle in the predella with the crucifixion transposed to the central pinnacle. The polyptic scheme is recorded in this drawing, made circa 1790, when portions of the painted surface had already been lost, but before the wooden support was sawn up to divide the individual panels into separate pictures for sale to private buyers. The, saw, the story follows a typical pattern, and the surviving fragments are now dispersed across collections in Europe and North America, although with the help of some digital technology, it is possible to regain some sense of the impact of the original altarpiece. Now, in the narrative fragments I survey in this talk are all drawn from Franciscan Dominican altarpieces um, and date, as I said, from uh, the beginning to the, uh, to the middle of the 15th century, by which period historiated predellas were pretty much standard features of altarpiece design. As I hope to show, however, differences persisted between Dominican and Franciscan practice, at least as far as central Italy was concerned. Moreover, the predella was not the only context for narrative in altarpiece design. The application of narrative scenes to the main field of an altarpiece that we noted with the My Star continued to inspire 15th century painters and patrons even though it stood in opposition to prevailing trends towards unified pictorial fields and the emergence of the so-called tavola quadrata, or square picture. The vibrant, vibrancy of this tradition, which is sometimes downplayed in surveys of Renaissance altarpieces, helps to explain the apparently conservative features of late polyptics like Sassetta's San Sepulcro altarpiece where one side of the altarpiece was given over to narrative scenes in the manner of the My Star. And in the final part of this talk, I'll talk specifically about this feature of Franciscan altarpiece design and the sources it drew upon. We start, however, with the Dominicans, represented in the exhibition by fragments from two large altarpieces for male houses in central Italy. The first was painted by the Sienese painter, Taddeo de Bartolo, probably just after 1400, and very likely for the Dominican church, I, for a Dominican church either in his native Siena or in Perugia. We can't be sure uh, exactly which. Two of the three identified scenes from a cycle of lives and miracles of Dominican saints are present in the exhibition and receive a thorough analysis in Shari Schenefeld's uh, exemplary catalog entry. 
Each scene focuses on a different Dominican saint. And in Sanctity Pictured, we have the panels of St. Thomas Aquinas presenting his office of Corpus Domini to Pope Urban IV, and the panel of St. Dominic raising the young Napoleone, Napoleone Orsini back to life while his grateful uncle, Cardinal Stefano, looks on. A third scene of the violent end of St. Peter Martyr is in Smith College, Massachusetts. Now, Georg Solberg has identified the Predella's central panel as a crucifixion now in Turin and has speculated that an obviously cut down panel of St. Peter Martyr may be a fragment of one of the saints from the main register. The latter is a more speculative link, but the fact that it always seems to have been in Siena would be a strong argument for a provenance from Taddeo's hometown rather than Perugia. And Taddeo interjected a crucifixion scene into the mendicant, uh, into one other mendicant predella that he painted for Perugia, which is this great double-sided altarpiece that he paints for the Franciscan church in the city, uh, uh, signed and dated in 1403, which has this image here of a crucifixion, which uh, is interjected into a cycle of Franciscan scenes that really goes around in circles both sides of the predella of this double-sided altarpiece. There's one of the Franciscan scenes now in Hanover, and there's the crucifixion now in the Louvre, which in this case has St. Francis kneeling at the foot of the cross. And we'll return to the typology of double-sided altarpieces later on when we turn to uh, Franciscan examples. Returning to Taddeo's Dominican predella, we cannot be sure what the fifth section of the predella would have shown. There's no obvious fourth male saint in the Dominican pantheon at this date, but a very similar cycle of predella scenes by Bernardo Daddi, painted earlier in the century for an altarpiece at Santa Maria Novella in Florence, may suggest an answer. Daddi's quartet of Dominican narratives balances one scene each for Peter Martyr and Aquinas, with two for the order's founder, and the same may have been the case for Taddeo's predella. But to judge from the surviving panels, the two predellas did not share any scenes in common, each focused on different episodes from the vitae of the sainted Dominicans. And this is another indication that the lives of Dominic, Peter Martyr, and also Aquinas were harder to abbreviate down to individual iconic narrative scenes in the way that Francis's stigmatization often stood alone. And what's more no noteworthy about Taddeo's and Bernardo's predellas is the manner in which they subordinate narrative cycles to a corporate view of the Dominican order, which emphasized community of sanctity over any one life. And a very similar rationale can be seen uh, slightly later in the 1420s in Frangelico's high altarpiece for, um, uh, for his own church, his own convent of San Domenico in Fiesole. Um, here again, we have the three Dominican saints, um, Aquinas, Dominic, Peter Martyr, and the quartet of saints here is completed by St. Barnabas. Why is he there? Well, the patron who funded the altarpiece and indeed much of the church was called Barnaba, so this stands for the lay patron. He gets the place of privilege, in fact, in the altarpiece. Um, but if we turn to the predella, and I should add, the reason why this looks a little strange is because the old piece is quite radically adapted at the end of the 15th century. It's put into a Al Antica style, classicizing style frame and has its background repainted. It would originally have been a gold ground. If we turn to the predella, and this just gives you an idea of what the original framing elements probably looks like, you can see that this is, in a way, a sort of supercharged 15th century observant version of what we've already seen with Taddeo de Bartolo and with Bernardo Daddi. So we've got the Dominican saints. You can pick them out here. They um, take their place amongst a much bigger pantheon of, uh, of sanctity, of the, uh, um, of the heavenly uh, community of saints, while the outermost predella panels 
now, are now absolutely bustling with a whole range of Dominican uh, blesseds or beati. And this really um, uh, give, uh, gives you a sense of the much greater intensity of the observant engagement with the order's history by this date. But the last word in this tradition would come with the Dominican conventuals at Modena in the second half of the 15th century. And this is a cycle of old pieces, which is represented by these three panels by the uh, Delieri brothers in the exhibition, three scenes from the life of St. Thomas Aquinas. But these are elements from one altarpiece in a series of four altarpieces, no less, that were commissioned for this church, uh, San Domenico in Modena. Now, this doesn't look very medieval. Uh, what we have today is an 18th century uh, construction which uh, replaced entirely a largely 15th century church. Now, the church before this had been consecrated in 1451, and in fact, it was in turn replacing an earlier 13th century church. And the pattern of Dominican settlement in Modena is a little bit unusual. The Dominicans actually finished this church relatively late. And those of you who've read Caroline Brazelius's book will be aware of the importance of these patterns of settlement. So the Dominican conventuals actually are in the position of having a brand new church as late as 1451 to kit out with new altarpieces. And they respond to this challenge by commissioning four heavily historiated altarpieces, one for each of their canonized saints. So Dominic, Peter Martyr, Thomas Aquinas, also by this date, those three have been joined by Vincent Ferrer, who was canonized in 1455. And this is the best preserved of those four the altarpiece of St. Peter Martyr, which gives you some idea of the narrative intensity of this format, which seems to have been shared by all four of the altarpieces. This is the altar of St. Vincent Ferrer, which can be reconstructed pretty convincingly from extant fragments. And you might note here this scene, which is a baptism scene, or conversion scene, which is here set within the interior of a Dominican church. And you'll be able to see this very prominently sited rood screen um, where um, the facade is studded with these roundels of Dominican saints, another important um, indication of the corporate nature of Dominican sanctity, and also probably an allusion to the location of this altarpiece and two of the other altarpieces. Um, in the quartet, because we know from Vasari's description that three of these altar pieces were indeed located beside the choir screen. And as far as the Thomas Aquinas altar piece is concerned, this is harder to reconstruct. We don't have all of the pieces. This is pretty speculative, but this should give you some idea of how the scenes which are upstairs may have fitted in to this larger ensemble. Now, the modern altarpieces arguably represent a final flourish to a venerable tradition of Dominican altarpiece design so perceptively analyzed by Bill Hood and Joanna Cannon. In this quartet of polyptics, Dominican narrative art finally matched Franciscan imagery in the scale of its ambition, although this achievement was still subordinated to an overarching vision that emphasized a community of canonized Dominicans. The same desire to see Dominican sanctity as a shared rather than an individual project, and arguably the same reticence in placing St. Dominic too far above the orders of the saints, are all aspects that can be traced back to Taddeo de Bartolo's Pradella panels and beyond. Now let's turn to the Franciscans. And the exhibition contains fragments from at least three Franciscan old pieces, one painted by Spinello Aretino, circa 1400, and the other two more or less contemporaneously by Bartolomeo di Tommaso and by Sassetta in the years around 1440. And these three commissions, as we'll see, are very closely intertwined, and the easiest way to disentangle them clearly is to approach the simplest first, rather than to run through them in chronological order. So I'll begin with this, a panel from the Walters by Bartolomeo de Tommaso, which represents the death of St. Francis. And this has been connected with a documented commission of 1439 between the artist and the friars of San Francesco in Cesena, 
a town located in the Romagna, but with close links to Umbria, and indeed Bartolomeo, the artist, was Umbrian, he was from Foligno. And that may uh, be relevant for some of the features uh, which we see in the iconography. And the surviving contract reveals a great deal about the commissioning process. Bartolomeo was to paint the altarpiece, destined for the church's high altar, and he would be given room and board, and he'd also receive wine as part of his payment. So not, not, a, bad, not a bad lodging deal. And he also had to submit test panels to the friars, including one of the predella, which may well have been of this scene that we see here, sort of quality control. Now, very little survives of the altarpiece. Only one other panel has been identified, this renunciation of the father, which is now in Urbino, and nothing remains of the church itself. That's completely gone. But it seems likely that this scene, given its landscape format, would have been the central predella scene. And that would mean that the subject was placed out of narrative sequence. And a precedent for this can be seen in Frangelico's version of the same scene, now in Berlin, but originally part of an altarpiece commissioned for a Florentine confraternity based at Santa Croce. And we seem to have all of the original Predella uh, panels from this altarpiece. And there really is no doubt that the death of St. Francis would have been the central scene. And it's possible that the friars at Cesena were aware of this, of this precedent. Now, the most distinctive aspect of the Walters panel is the way in which the death of St. Francis is combined with the canonization of the saint, which is occurring here. Here we have the Pope and the bull of canonization being composed. And there really are no precedents for this. And Roberto Cobianchi talks specifically about this detail in his catalog entry. And this little subscene includes a papal notary who's writing everything down. And there's a good rationale for that, but there aren't actually any visual precedents for it in earlier Franciscan painting. And he is surely related to this figure of a notary that appears in, uh, who appears in Cicetta's San Sepulcro altarpiece, recording the peace agreement between St. Francis and the ferocious wolf at Gubbio. Now, quite how this coincidence happens, probably at almost precisely the same time, around 1440, is hard to say. The assumption is probably that the ideas are coming from Sassetta, who is um, by far the more accomplished artist. Um, but it's equally likely that these connections could have come through networks of friars. One thinks of the, of the control that the friars at Cesena exercised over uh, Bartolomeo's um, uh, uh, painting of his altarpiece, for example. Now, this provides a neat introduction to Sassetta's famous altarpiece for San Francesco and San Sepulcro. And this is one of the most elaborate of all Renaissance altarpieces. It's the most expensive we know of, and it's certainly the most richly documented and intensively studied, thanks to the research of many scholars, particularly of James Banker of the University of North Carolina and of Machtalt Israels, who headed an international research project dedicated to this altarpiece. And the San Sepulchre altarpiece is represented in Sanctity Pictured by this predella scene of the way to Calvary, now in Detroit. And in the catalog, uh, Trinita Kennedy and Holly Flora discuss the ways in which the apparently diverse scenes of the altarpiece are knitted together by motifs which would have resonated deeply with a Franciscan audience. For example, the crown of thorns, which crops up prominently here, and also in the image of the crucifixion, which is in Cleveland, and in other images, uh, other sections of the altarpiece as well. Or indeed, the rope by which Christ is being dragged and the way it echoes the cord of the Franciscan habit. Now, thanks to recent research, we now have a comprehensive and confident reconstruction of the San Sepulcro polyptic. And you see here, this is where the Detroit panel is located on the front side of the predella. Like Tadio de Bartolo's polyptic uh, from Perugia, which I showed you earlier, 
The Sun Sepulchro altarpiece was double-sided, a typology that reflected local liturgical custom um, in, amongst the uh, Franciscans of central Italy. And as far as we know, the appearance of St. Francis in that little crucifixion panel, uh, now in Cleveland, was the saint's only appearance on the front side of the altarpiece. However, the back was dominated by his central effigy and by surrounding narratives from Francis's life, arranged in two quartets to either side. Now, for the San Sepulcro polyptic, we're extraordinarily uh, fortunate to have this document, which is perhaps the richest document pertaining to any Renaissance um, altarpiece that we know of. It really is a step-by-step -step instruction guide given by the friars to Sassetta, detailing every single element that was going to go uh, into the design of the polyptic. And the passion scenes, including the one in Detroit, uh, specified in this little passage here, le storie della passione. Quelle che sono più devote e sono quattro. The, the stories of the passion, those which are particularly devout, and there are going to be four of them. And one of those we, we have upstairs. This is 1439. And the same document lists the eight scenes from St. Francis's life. You can see they're numbered very conveniently one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Very clear. And also, we've got this passage at the top here, which is, which is a which has provoked a lot of debate, and I'll just translate it for you. Um, it really says that the central figure of St. Francis is to be shown enthroned in uno tono, like the one in Cita di Castello, that's the neighboring town to San Sepolcro, with those virtues around the head and the vices at the feet. Now, Cita di Castello is not only San Sepolcro's close neighbor, in the Middle Ages, its Franciscan house was the immediate superior to the San Sepulcro convent. Now, what was this image in Cita di Castello, impressive enough to serve as the model for the centerpiece of the most expensive altarpiece of the Quattrocento? Well, it might have looked something like this, an enthroned figure of St. Francis, like the one we have at Assisi. I'd say that's less likely. This is the image that Sassetta finally paints of St. Francis in, for, uh, in a mandala, which can be understood as a kind of throne with the monastic virtues of um, uh, chastity, um, obedience, and poverty above, and the vices of, avarice, of um, vainglory, pride, and avarice below. My suspicion is that Sassetta paints exactly what he's asked to paint, and indeed that would match with the image earlier painted by Taddeo de Bartolo, where we see St. Francis trampling on the same vices. So what was at Cita di Castello? Well, one fragment that has been associated with a major Franciscan altarpiece at Cita di Castello is the one we have upstairs by Spinello Aretino, usually dated around 1400 and now in Chicago. And that has a firm provenance from the town. Now, myself and others have made the proposal that this was originally part of a series of eight narrative scenes, like the polyptic at San Sepulchre. And this proposal has not found universal favor, but I still believe it to be correct. And this leads us to the third and final uh, altarpiece, uh, Franciscan altarpiece, that I'm going to consider today. I've got, Trinita, I've got a couple more minutes to go. Is that okay? Am I... I, I, I will, I, there isn't, uh, there isn't too far to go. This is the final example. We can make a number of observations if we compare the two altar tables in the, in the two churches, two Franciscan churches at San Sepulchre and Chiudi di Castello, which very happily still survive, and they're both absolutely enormous, as you can see from these measurements. In fact, the, the altar mensa at Chiudi di Castello is larger than the one at San Sepulcro, and the proportions, the proportional difference, as it were, is roughly equal to the difference in size between the narrative scenes at San Sepulcro and the one that we've got at Cita di Castello. So if you were to multiply this scene up following the schema of the San Sepulcro altarpiece, in fact, you'd get something that would fit quite snugly over this truly enormous 
Alta Mensa at Chita di Castello. Now, that might just be coincidence. It's, it's rather circumstantial. This would be the, uh, the uh, Chicago panel's likely location within a broader sequence. Now, I think it's possible that we do, in fact, possess a full visual record of the altarpiece that Spinello painted in Chita di Castello. And it takes the form, admittedly not um, a particularly prepossessing form, of these wooden inlay or intarsia images, which are much later. They date from the middle of the 16th century, but they're in the church at Chita di Castello. And I would suggest that they copy and record the iconography from an earlier altarpiece. Now, this cycle is clearly interested in earlier Franciscan art. I say here we are in 1550s, most likely, but some of the scenes obviously copy some of the fresco scenes in Bonozza Gozzoli's cycle at Montefalco that we saw earlier today, painted in 1452. This is a fresco cycle in the Umbrian church, in the Montefalco church, just further to the south in the same province, Umbria. You can see how this very idiosyncratic representation of the birth of St. Francis is reprised in great detail. And other scenes by Gozzoli, like the uh, um, expelling of the demons from Arezzo or the preaching to the birds, are in fact joined together, in some cases flipped, but amalgamated with very little differentiation in the figure groups, even to the extent that these local donors, who are specific to Montefalco, reappear here. This scene puzzled me for a long time. This is St. Francis praying before the crucifix in Montefalco, and then leaving some, uh, le sorry, the crucifix in San Damiano, and then leaving some money within the church for its rebuilding. This doesn't correspond to any surviving fresco at Montefalco, but in fact, if you look at the window, here we are in Montefalco, there's an inscription that runs below, here it is, which records a lost scene. Originally, this window was bricked up and painted by Gozzoli, which depicted exactly this subject. So I think it's very likely that in this intarsia, we actually have a unique record of a lost fresco by Bonozzo Gozzoli, which is, which is very exciting in itself, the lost piece of the Montefalco um, uh, cycle. So some of the intarsia scenes derive from Gozzoli at Montefalco, but some clearly don't. And of those, one of them depicts the confirmation of the rule, and it can be compared very closely with the Chicago panel that we've got upstairs. It's a little hard to see, but if we zoom in, just focus on one particular detail. Here we've got St. Francis handing over the rule. He holds the rule in a very particular fashion across his hand, and that detail is reprised exactly in the intarsia, and it occurs in no other Franciscan image, to my knowledge. And indeed, if one puts together the remaining Franciscan scenes, in fact, you can put together the whole cycle. So here we've got one quartet, here we've got another, and after you put all of these together, there's one intarsia panel left, which is this one, very handily. It's a St. Francis enthroned with the virtues and vices, just like the image that's described in the document for San Sepulcro. And one could analyze these more closely. I'm just going to skip through these to save time, but there are precedents for all of the iconographic details that occur here. And indeed, one could put together an entire scheme like this. Now, basically, to, if one accepts the linkage between these intarsia schemes and Spinello's painting, then the Chicago panel acquires a historical and iconographic importance far greater than its intrinsic artistic merits becomes the sole surviving remnant of one of the most significant Franciscan commissions from the decades around 1400, and the fundamental bridge between the canonical model of the upper church frescoes at Assisi and Sassetta's much more inventive rendering of the Franciscan altarpiece, uh, story on his San Sepulcro altarpiece. 
Now, in the example of Spinello's panel underlines the value of an exhibition like Sanctity Pictured, which uses the fragmentation of Renaissance panel painting to its advantage. Only through a display like the one upstairs can we appreciate the networks that underpinned altarpiece production in this period. The complex relationship between the two orders has already been flagged in the other papers and over questions. Through a judicious choice of narrative scenes, Sanctity Pictured also has important things to say about the respective approaches to altarpiece design by the Franciscan and Dominican orders, underlining the Dominican preference towards corporate shared sanctity on one hand and the Franciscan preference, their enduring em emphasis on their charismatic founder on the other. Thank you. Time for just a couple of questions. If anyone would like to ask um, Jonal um, anything about his paper, and thank you so much for your talk. First off, I'd like to thank you for re reuniting these altarpieces with their Fidelo panels. And I wanted to ask you, at what point, given how important they were to churches, um, at what point did the Predella panels become so completely dis disconnected to their frames? And, and then secondly, I would just like to have you com comment on the fact that wood screens so you know, prevented ordinary people from actually seeing the Predella panels up close or the altarpieces really up close. And um, so I'd like to hear you talk more about that. Okay, well, two, two questions. Um, to respond quickly to the first, it varies the, um, in a sense, the dismembering and destruction of frames. I mean, this is happening over quite a long period. Some of the early, um, uh, uh, um, uh, if you like, segmentations of altar pieces can be traced back even to the 17th century. Or, so this is happening over a long time, but there's definitely, after the Napoleonic suppressions, an intense activity of uh, uh, destruction. Uh, and uh, resale that goes on. I, if that does that, I mean, that was what you were uh, asking. In, in terms of the second question, you know, to what extent do internal divisions of mendicant churches hinder the visibility of altarpieces? I mean, I think we're, we're, the, the way that recent research has been, has, been, uh, has been going, has been leading us towards, is really to emphasize a more nuanced um, a, a view of the church interior, which really changes according to what's going on within a church at any one particular time. There might be mass at the high altar, during which time divisions are quite rigorously enforced. At other times, documentation suggests that church interiors could be, could be very open, and in fact, access to both male and female laity could have extended even to um, spaces like chapter houses, sacristies, example, for example, and other conventual spaces. So I think that's, that's sort of where we are at the moment. So not necessarily permanent, constant access, but much more episodic access, but access nonetheless. Um, I just a follow up on that, and then I have my own question. Wouldn't also uh, funerals be a time when there's going to be more access to seeing the artwork? Yeah. Y maybe. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm sure that's right. And also, I mean, we know, I mean, uh, and this is an area where the, there's more work to be done, and, and your research is, is, has been very important here. The, you know, what actually happens for major funerals within mendicant churches, the, the amount of paraphernalia, of artistic ephemera that's often commissioned for those events, and how church interiors are really transformed, albeit on a temporary basis, for the, these kinds of rites. I think this is, this is particularly, you know, this is an area for, for much future research. There's a difficult in, difficulty in, in, in getting source material, but I think there are sources out there. I can think of one great inventory of a, of a, a major funeral in San Domenico Pistoia that springs to mind, and mm. this kind of source might be able to tell us a great deal more about, uh, about these rather, you know, uh, um, elusive uh, but nonetheless important events. 
So that actually segues to my own question. The, the two examples you gave of, I think it was Chazena or Chastello mm -hmm. and the, the other altarpiece with the strict instructions. Mm -hmm. Do you think that was something that was common and we just don't have the documentary evidence or do you think there's a special Franciscan attention to dictating what the picture is going to look like? I think probably this was much more common. Uh, the Sassata document survives by chance. It's a loose folio which was not, you know, really wasn't intended to have been preserved as a permanent notarial document. Uh, and, you know, it was one of the most amazing archival discoveries, discovery made by, by Jim Banker, um, published in 1993. It's in the vernacular, whereas the contract is in Latin. One imagines that there, was a, there, there were many more of these folie volanti, these, these sort of loose sheets which were, which were um, composed during the commissioning process that we don't have anymore. Probably it was kept with regard to the San Sepulcro contract because Sassetta had insisted on painting the old piece in Siena, not in San Sepulcro. So he's not going to be on site. And this document and keeping this document is in a way a form of control, a form of monitoring his work from a distance. That's a sort of particular circumstance which probably enters into the equation there. Thank you for your paper, Don. I wonder if you could say a word to this audience, why the Franciscans, in particular with the wonderful Sassetta altarpiece at uh, San Sepulcro, would have painted on the back? Yes. Um, Double-sided altarpieces uh, have been a subject of a great deal of research in, in recent years. Uh, they're uh, much more complex than single-sided altarpieces. They're um, commissioned for various reasons. Um, uh, the the altarpiece I showed you from Siena Cathedral, Deuterius my is of course double-sided. There seems to be a distinct tradition of Franciscan double-sided altarpieces in Umbria, and this seems to relate to a particular way of organizing churches in the Order's Umbrian province, uh, which instead of having the choirs, that's the choir in the sense of the choir stalls of the friars, located in front of the high altar, as in, say, Santa Maria Novella, in, in the example that Anne just showed us, they're in fact located behind, which is a configuration that we tend to associate much more with the Tridentine reform from the late 16th century onwards. Why exactly this happens, why it's confined to the province of the Franciscan or the Umbrian province of the Franciscan order and not to others, as soon as you cross the border into Tuscany, things change. Quite why this is the case which, you know, still isn't clearly understood, but it shows that there's a great deal of variety in terms of the order's patronage. So we need to think not only in terms of differences between different orders, but also differences between different provinces within the same order and the way in which they were using art and architecture to develop their own distinctive regional identities, even within the context of one uh, order's inst institutions. Yeah. 